I'm Brian Foster, and this is the Grindhouse Institute. On each episode of this podcast, Jeremy Floyd and I program a double or triple feature movie night. Each of the movies share common themes, and we discuss them here. We're happy you could join us for the second part of a two-part block we call Scorsese Gangsters. The gangster film has been a touchstone in Scorsese's half-century-long career. He's done other types of gangsters, like Gangs of New York, The Departed, and arguably Wolf of Wall Street, but there was a more particular brand of mid-to-late 20th century East Coast Italian-American gangster that he was able to mold into his own genre, a Scorsese gangster. As with most gangster films, there is a rise followed by a fall. The Scorsese gangster films in this block put the emphasis on the fall. Once upon a time, there was a dazzling neon spectacle built by gangsters raiding the Teamsters pension fund. Like the pharaohs before them, they erected monuments to themselves in the middle of the desert that they called casinos. In the Tangiers Casino lived a handicapper named Ace and his wife Ginger and his best friend Nicky, and they all lived happily ever after. Well, not exactly. Robert De Niro, Sharon Stone, Joe Pesci, about a half dozen stand-up comics, and the Sam Rothstein Dancers star in 1995's Casino. After fighting 411 days in Patton's army, Frank Sheeran rotated back stateside to ply his trade as a truck driver and house painter. It wasn't long before he was recruited by the Buffalino crime family, becoming the Forrest Gump of mid-century American crime. According to his account, he was involved in the Bay of Pigs, the crazy Joey Gallo hit, the Hoffa disappearance, and there's even a hint of a connection to the JFK assassination. Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Harvey Keitel, Joe Pesci, and a dozen other Scorsese alums star in 2019's adaptation of I Heard You Paint Houses, The Irishman. Thank you for listening to the Grindhouse Institute. Please enjoy. He went against everything and everybody, just didn't give a shit. Kidnapped his own bosses. I don't don't know how he got away with that. You don't get away with that. You do that, you die. It's funny, Brian, because um, I'd been prepping for this for a few days now, and uh, I just last night was working, and I happened to catch Goodfellas on Paramount TV or whatever, and it's one of those movies, of course. I was like, oh, I'll watch a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it, it was. <laughs> yeah. It was. It was the. Be- I just listened to the your previous episode, right? And so I was like, I, what I like to do is I always like to go back and look at the like opening sequence of a movie because I always remember that. Kubrick would say that like the the very first shot you put in your film is always the most important, but it's always very subtle. I mean, no one very rarely remembers the very first shot, but so I always like to go back. And so I was like, oh, I saw this kind of at the beginning. I was like, I'm going to go back and just watch the intro because I just listened to your episode. <laughs> and next thing I know, I'm like an hour into it. I've got like all this work I need to do to get out. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I just watched half the movie. Well, I might as well watch the other half at this point. <laughs> when you love someone, You've got to trust them. There's no other way. Otherwise, what's the point? And for a while, I believed that's the kind of love I had. All right, welcome back to the Grindhouse Institute. I'm Brian Foster, and with me as always is Jeremy Floyd. Hello, and how are you? I asked you. I asked you. You only exist out here because of me. (laughs) I knew something was coming. You kind of got that all prepared. (laughs) I heard yeah. you paint houses, though, Jeremy. Is that, is that true? Is that something that you do on your spare time? I do my own carpentry, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Jeremy, we also have a very special guest today on this very special show. Um, would you like to do the introduction? Yeah. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, the most uh, returning champion here. Um, and uh, Ken Jennings. The Ken Jennings of our show. Yeah. <laughs> Friend of the show. Yeah, the, the silent partner, uh, Andy Buigas. Hey, guys. Good to be here. Welcome excited back. Excited about this episode. I figured, I figured you'd be very excited about this episode, as um, I am as well. Um, this one was fantastic, um, and it's a sequel to our first part episode of Scorsese Gangsters, which was released today um, and your local podcast platforms and all that. Yeah. Um, in that episode, we focused on Mean Streets, Raging Bull, and Goodfellas, and today we are talking about Casino and The Irishman. Only two movies this time, but it's about the, the length of about five <laughs> movies. So Yeah, but somehow we watched uh, more, uh, more movies for this, uh, more screen time anyway. Yeah, uh, this is, um, 
it's uh yeah it, it's part two of our scorsese thing it's definitely a uh something that scorsese was working on for his whole career essentially like you know kind of telling this this saga building upon it each time and, and this you know ending with the irishman kind of feels like almost like a retrospective in in certain ways you mean or, to his career well or well to his uh, gangster saga and p- potentially career but i mean he, he is working on another movie at the moment but like um more importantly, like the Irishman plays as sort of the, you know, third act to like, like the, the the final piece of the arc for all of um all of these movies we watched so far. That's a good call. Um, I hadn't seen Casino in quite some time and saw The Irishman for the first time. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was a birthday present, uh, a Blu-ray yeah. copy of uh, <laughs> of The Irishman. Um, yeah, that was the first time I'd seen that movie. I didn't even see it when it was on Netflix. I don't know why. Um, I think yeah. that I was turned off by the CG um, without giving it a real chance. Um, I mean, I'll get that Same. out right I, away. Yeah. Whenever they announced the movie and they're like, oh, it's taking so long because they're, you know, doing some de-aging, you know, nonsense. I was like, oh, man, what the hell? But didn't they do that so well with Henry Hill, the young Henry Hill? And like they had these <laughs> yeah. great, the great yeah, the young to... Tommy and, you know. What about the old Jimmy Conway? Yeah, yeah. I'm about that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I'm glad you watched it on Blu-ray because the trans, the Criterion transfer is great. It's amazing. I, I I saw it on Netflix in the theater on Netflix and on Blu-ray, and the Blu-ray looks great. It looked amazing. Um, it's it. Yeah. I mean, we talk about the uh, the polish that he put on his movies once we got out of that Goodfellas uh, era, and this one has mm-hmm. it. It's like pristine. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful looking film. And uh, these movies also offer a nice tie into an earlier episode I was on with uh, when we talked about Heat. Brian, you'll appreciate this because <laughs> Casino came out a month before which Heat. Movie? By the way, never heard of that. No. What, what? Which? What's this Heat movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, one, one of these days. Yeah, and I'm not talking days. about LA Takedown. I'm talking yeah. about the, the actual. Yeah, I was gonna heat. say there's a movie called LA Takedown. Is that the one you're referring to? <laughs> I've seen that one. <laughs> yeah. But isn't that impressive that De Niro had these two great films come out in the same year? That's very impressive. Um, and That's the fact awesome. that he is just so amazingly good as as Sam Rothstein. It was just extremely fun to watch him. And, and I was just joking with Jeremy about that last shot of him with his glasses. It's like one of the most iconic like images of Rothstein with those big, thick, like scuba right. gear glasses at the end. Yeah. And it's yeah. just really, really good stuff. It's It's weird that he mixes like, that's clearly a funny, you know, visual thing. You know, it's funny to look at. And, you know, Scorsese's great at mixing all that stuff together. But what an amazing epic film. What is it that, like, how is it that he gets away with having such a funny image, but also have it be tragic uh, in a way at the end? You know, it's like you're, you're really feeling for him at that moment. Because, you know, it's just like his eyes are so just like dead. And, you know, he's, he's been hollowed out by this whole experience. He's, you know, he died a long time ago and his body is still there. But like you know, he takes off the comical glasses, and and you you see that. I I guess it sort of makes it, you know, so he's so naked mm. in that you can't even laugh at it in a way because it's like it you know you're 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 feeling it too much. Well, it's also representative of of him losing the glitz and glamour of Vegas, right? I mean, it's the ultimate mm-hmm. expression. He went from having these really flashy suits and and right. uh, and a cigarette holder like. Lionel Barrymore. You Look lost at you, your you're fucking walking around like John Barrymore. Yeah. A fucking yeah. pink robe and a fucking uh, a cigarette holder. <laughs> but, he was, <laughs> <laughs> but he was also back to being kind of a bookie, right? Or like picking winners. You know, it, it was he wasn't in that like big higher upper right, echelon right. like casino owner. He was now just back to where he was. Yeah, but it wasn't the flashy lifestyle that he was leading, right? He kind of became kind of became a nobody when he was like running, you know, a big casino in Vegas uh, during his heyday. So it's, I, I think back to what you're saying, Jeremy, I mean, I think that's Scorsese's uh, masterful cr- craft, right? I mean, he it's two hours of building pathos. So that tragedy really hits home and, and it kind of contrasts with, um, you know, kind of his look with the glasses. But when he takes that off, you see kind of the man that's kind of left behind after this whole life experience right yeah i mean and i think it was almost like three hours right <laughs> yeah e- even yeah. more time yeah and and most of those hours i f- i was thinking are fairly uncomfortable <laughs> it's it's interesting comparing this i happened to watch goodfellas recently and i i listened to your your previous episode which was great 
Um, but comparing this to Goodfellas, which is, is hard not to do, um, it's interesting how Goodfellas, for a lot of it, is a lot of fun and nostalgic and, and, and it feels like a, a cocaine riddle mm. roller coaster ride. But right. Casino, after the first couple montages that set up the characters, it's just uncomfortable scene after uncomfortable scene, you know, and it's like, you know, the right. relationship between him and Nikki, him and Ginger, the way he handles the the gaming board, the way, you know, um, the bosses are kind of... Uh, you mean Tommy like, Smothers or one of the Smothers brothers? <laughs> yeah, D- right. Dick Smothers, Dick yeah. Dick Smothers, yeah. <laughs> Alfred E. Newman, the Senator <laughs> Alfred E. Newman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of like waking up in Vegas after a long night. You know, it's just got a lot of that uh, hangover to it. And, and, yeah. and you feel like re- you kind of feel worn out after watching it. Right. I mean, there's just I was I was thinking about that scene where he can't let go of how much James Woods spend on a suit. Yeah, and you're just right. like, exactly. just right. drop it. You're just saying, right. hey, right. just please, let's just get through dinner. All right. What was it? Yeah. 30, 30 grand or something for a suit. He's yeah. Like, He's like, even if he could get fitted that fast. <laughs> He's like sitting at dinner like, now, now wait, really, really quick, really quick. What about the suit again? <laughs> yeah, I, lo- I love him doing the, the rough math of what's a good time in, in Beverly Hills for a weekend. Three grand at most. <laughs> but the, the point is that you, the whole time there are all these scenes where you're just like, oh, you know, don't do it, Ace. Don't do that. Just let it go. Let it go. But it's like, right. but it, it's his um, steadfastness and his stubbornness that is one of his biggest flaws, right? I mean, it goes along with his obsessiveness and his need for control um, because, you know, he's essentially working for the mob, so any amount of control he has is just just really a show, right? Because at the end of the day, he still, uh, you know, uh, has to follow the commands of of the bosses, and, and at the end of the day, when they say he's done, he's actually done, so... But but it's funny because, like, you know, he he has control over everything uh down to the most you know minute detail he's you know watching all the dancers wait and you know he's constantly like you know you know picking up the 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 stations and like you know making sure that people have them clean do you know how to set dice down what the hell did you learn how to do yeah like he's like look at your look at your muffin look at my muffin look at your muffin look at my muffin it's like man that was here says too many blueberries it's falling apart mine is none at all (laughs) and he like you know he goes and like you know bust the 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 cook's balls for uh for you know not not putting enough (laughs) blueberries in there do you know how long that's going to take (laughs) like and, and and yet like uh when he first meets ginger you know, she does something like insane, and uh, you know he doesn't have uh, you know four goons uh, you know, open the door with her head or whatever, and, like, <laughs> and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, and, and it's like it speaks to how she has this sort of like control over him. You know, he like as no one else can essentially. Like maybe maybe Nikki could, but it was mostly you know, her and, and, and the effect that she had on him. And it, and it kind of speaks to how powerful that was. I mean, I think that that's a good segue into bringing up her uh, tour de force performance, Sharon Stone, in this film that... Amazing. When you're talking yeah. about uncomfortable scenes, those scenes of her and James Woods in front of her daughter doing blow and like right, just right. her absolute psychotic meltdown in the in the front <laughs> yard, driving the car <laughs> up into the house, like... Right. <laughs> You're going to be sorry if you don't Don't stop you that. threaten me! Neighbor- don't you threaten me! I mean, she was brilliant in this. Um, and I mean, I obviously one of, one of those, like, show stealers. Yeah, I mean, it, she, was, she was mind-blowing. I mean, like, um, and it's not as though she hadn't been good in other movies or in other roles or whatever, but for some reason, th- this one just has this you know particular alchemy to it that made her just so magical mm-hmm. in that role. And it's, it's just you know, mind-blowing. And so although this was a story um, that was written, these were just based on on real people. Like Sam was based on uh, another guy, Frank Lefty Rosenthal, and Ginger was another person and all that. Um, I guess they just yeah. changed that for the for the story, or was that for uh, for the movie? I was I was wondering that part. I, I didn't get into that research. In, in the are you asking about the book? Yeah. Of Casino. Yeah, I mean in, in the book they it's about whatever their real names are. Got you know, it. Lefty Rosenthal and um what was it? what was Nikki's real name? It was like Anthony Spilotro. That that thing, you know. So he used all the names. Yeah, it seems like uh, you know this is a true story, but the names were changed to protect the innocent right. type of uh, situation, or or perhaps it's that 
you know, they wanted to take more liberties with the, with the story. You know, I don't know. Shock that uh, that Scorsese didn't win the best picture for this one. Um, I mean, same as Goodfellas <laughs> too, and all the rest of his movies that he's done. Um, but this one in particular, because it was just such a like a complete package um, of just quality. I I think so too. It, it you know, this one is tough because it's like. Um, in in a way, like it it seems like oh the studio wanted a sequel to Goodfellas, and this is what it came up with. It's like you know oh we, we we've traded this territory before, mm. and to me, uh, Goodfellas is probably the better movie, but I like Casino more. Interesting. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think Casino's more challenging movie. Something I, I brought up earlier about it being comfortable, but it's it's also. Um, less fun you know even though it's it's got a lot of the style um it replaces that roller coaster ride with more theatricality so i agree with you jeremy i feel like this is just like um a great follow-up to goodfellas because it's kind of taking the genre and approaching it from you know another level of maturity right i mm-hmm. mean it's it's operatic at times think about the the opening the title card sequence i mean yeah. there's that great imagery of a character descending into hell and and being engulfed in flames. Right, right. After, really after they awesome. showed the, the car blowing up and all that. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> so dramatic. And visually, it's, it's so nuanced and at the same time very stylized, but very theatrical, which I thought was really great. If you think about the introduction to a lot of the characters, you know, you have like the, the opening image of, of Ace and it's a silhouette, you know, pushing on the silhouette of his back as he turns around into the spotlight. Right. Yeah. Just that amazing... <laughs> introduction to ginger she's throwing the the chips all over the place on the casino floor <laughs> well well actually like where we first see her is in this narrated montage i think you know nikki's helping to, to narrate some of that and we see her at the fountain she's like you know looking back over her shoulder at the camera uh and so it's a, sort of like a disembodied pov an unexplained pov i should say it's also um, yeah and it's um that image in particular is really important because it's uh, an idealized imagery of her, right? It's kind of how you imagine Ace remembers her. Exactly. It's like, right. I, I actually think it's the most beautiful she is in the movie in that particular shot, and I, I think there's a reason for that. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, it's interesting because the characters like make entrances and introduced to different characters in the movie. I also really love when she's introduced to Nikki. Right. Holy shit! What are you been doing out here? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing out here? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This beautiful statuesque woman that comes in, and you can just see like the look on both of their faces, just awesome, right. you know. <laughs> and and then even Nikki introducing his brother, one of my favorite Scorsese shots, which to set to the Rolling Stones, that tracking shot across his um, gold store is just oh you know, right, amazing shot, right? Super stylized, but at the same time it's got this emotional weight to it. It's despite the music and the upbeat music, it's not really like a fun ride, right? It's difficult. It's gritty. It's like Vegas in the daytime. It's, yeah. you know, even, it's, even the murder set pieces in Goodfellas were kind of a good time. Like Billy Batts's beat down and all that. It was kind of like a full fun thing, especially with the De Niro shot of him stepping on his, on yeah. the camera's face. You know? <laughs> but this one, you know, you've got the Nikki poking the guy's neck with the pen and all that. And it's like yeah. hard to look at, you know, it's like, and then Nikki and his brother getting toasted at the end. That's one of yeah. the hardest things to see. And you, like the, the, the dirt coming out of the, the dead right. bodies or the dying right. body's mouth and shit. I was like, oh, my God. He's still breathing. Yeah. He's still breathing. Oh. Like that whole thing. Oh. And, and it's crazy because like, you know, all of those moments, I mean, like as violent and crazy as some of the previous Scorsese movies were, particularly Goodfellas, uh, this one amped it up a notch. It, it's like. It's somehow like the vice do- doubled down on those things. Yeah, the, the the vice scene. I think that was probably the the, the most. Uh, I don't know. It, it's probably a toss up between Nikki's demise and Nikki's torture of uh, you made me stick ice picks in your balls for Charlie M. Charlie fucking M. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I gotta say, I'm glad that Frank Vincent finally got his his retribution on beating the <laughs> yeah. hell out of Joe. Fetch I was just I was just thinking that I was, I was, I was after watching Goodfellas again. I was like, oh, that that and must Raging Bull. A nice wink by the filmmakers. Pesci yeah. kicked his ass twice. <laughs> <laughs> didn't the movie get an NC-17 rating at first, or wasn't? Didn't they uh, I, have that issue at some point? I read somewhere a long time ago that like some of those scenes got cut down for violence. In particular, the head vice. Like 
he only says I I popped out Pop your fucking eye. eye for Charlie yeah. M. But apparently in the original one that they try to get past the censors, uh, you see it. Uh, we see it. And, and they uh, don't <laughs> they don't actually chop off the cheater's hands, which I, I thought that, that's probably what's gonna happen. Cheater's justice. That thing. Yeah. I, I think it it's interesting because what that really makes me realize is that there is a little bit of a visual irony in a way because the the film is beautiful in a lot of ways. Right, and, right. and the imagery is very theatrical. I mean, Robert Richardson's lighting is amazing. Um and there's this um you know, much in the theme of Vegas, there's this um kind of facade and yeah. uh like uh, make believe and yeah, make believe yeah. aspect, but Upfront. the violence and the emotional violence and the conflict is such that it makes you look away, right? So on the one hand, the right. camera draws you in with its beauty, its its um, uh, kind of visual power, but at the same Hypnotic time, you don't, camera moves, all these things, yeah, yeah. You you kind of want to look away, or you're like yeah. uncomfortable. It makes you fidget. So no, I, it's I, an amazing. I think that that's like the best way to describe it. Like almost everything is uncomfortable, unlike maybe some of the violence and whatever you could revel in, in a way in Goodfellas. Uh, this one makes it hard to look at each scene with De Niro and, and Sharon Stone a- after a certain point becomes just so uncomfortable. You, 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 it's like hard to look at the screen. Pesci and De Niro arguing, you know, makes you uncomfortable. Like e- even Pesci, when he like grabbed his son's jaw to like kiss him on the, on the cheek, like, cause it clocks your heart that that moment. And he's like, you're so smart. <laughs> Right, it's like, you know, for, for, for the first time I saw that, I was like, oh my god, he's gonna kill him. I know, right? <laughs> like, yeah, know? it's like everything makes you uncomfortable, and you know, <laughs> him arguing with LQ Jones about uh, what's his name, Joe Bob Briggs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm glad that Joe Bob Briggs uh, made a cameo in this, and he actually had a pretty oh, substan- sorry, Mr. substantial yeah. role in it too. It was pretty yeah. funny. <laughs> every every time I watch that movie, I'm just, and and he, he asks, "Isn't there something a little bit further down the trough?" I'm like, "Just let him like wait tables yeah. or right. sort out the blueberries or do something." Exactly. Yeah. Put him on blueberry sure, duty. Listen, you need you need more more people in the kitchen sorting out blueberries. Like that was Rothstein's problem, right? He didn't want to play that game in that in that in that field, right? He wanted to play his game in their field, and they had all the power, right? They had the power to take away that license or never give it to him, and he could have just gave the guy a job, right? And his dad or his uncle, whoever it was, would have been fine with it, right? But Instead, he yeah, exactly. had, to, had to exert his power. I think it's the theme that runs through both of these films, actually, if you think about it, this kind of false sense of having control, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, mm. not to skip ahead, but uh, the character of Hoffa and the Irishman, same thing. Sure. There's this idea that all that mattered was the union was his, much like the casino is. He thought he was movie. untouchable. He he thought that whatever he knew about the mob, that he'd never go away or never they'd yeah, never right. touch him because of that. Like, that that Bullshit. scene that you're referencing, like it, it really, it feels so much like the Johnny Boy character, yes, in Mean Streets, right? Same kind of like, same kind of conversation. It's just like you know, you you were out of your mind. Like, get your shit together, dude. There are going to be consequences here. Yeah, you are in. <laughs> yeah. Way, yeah, you're treading in dangerous territory. Right, and I I feel like when we'll, I'll get to this a little bit more in, with the Irishman, but <laughs> it does remind me a lot of uh, the James Elroy world in the sense that that. Yeah. They're all these people that have influence and are kind of players and the things that in the world that goes on around you. But ultimately, what they come to realize is there's always someone that's got more power or someone that's really calling the shots or there's um, something that's really going to um, impose its influence on you. And coming to terms with that oftentimes leads to the tragedy of the characters. I mean, I think... Right. Nikki forgot that in Casino and he kind of pushed a little too hard and he didn't realize, you know, he forgot that the bosses back home are, you know, keeping a watch on him and he wasn't keeping a a low profile by any means. You know, he was out there screwing everybody over and killing people left and right. Yeah, and getting headlines. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like drawing the attention, like all that stuff. But uh, I, I do have to say, though, that, again, the mixture of humor in that is when those feds uh they run out of fuel circling the you know watching over the, the house there and they, they have to land in that field that's one of the funniest right. things you just see those two guys in suits just running they say nothing they just <laughs> yeah it's, it's like taking bets on hitting the plane yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly um i did want to bring up uh, don rickles in casino because he's he's excellent um yeah. i think he gets his ass beats uh for, briefly by uh nikki uh, right, right. which is pretty sad D- during the scene where it's like just take this stiff 
and pounded up your sister's ass. <laughs> Also a super uncomfortable scene, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. Look at this fucking butte. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I, but it, how crazy is it like that he cast so many comedians in this? Uh, you know, Dick Smothers, Don Rickles, Alan King, yeah. uh, Kevin Pollack, I think you yeah, yeah. pointed out the other day. It's part of that ironic power, right? I mean, it's like this idea that you're yeah. playing against their typecast and... Um, there's this visual expectation that does not match your experience watching the film, right? Alan King's really good in in this too. Uh, yeah, very, I mean, I think yeah. we talked about this before. It's when he Scor- says that, it's like a papal bull. <laughs> <laughs> Scorsese can really get a get a performance out of somebody, um, and I mean, even those right. non actors or non dramatic actors. Yeah, or like uh, for example, the actor that plays his uh, banker. Oh, the the guy from Office from Space. Office Space? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> the people person, damn it! <laughs> it's a mat with different conclusions. The jump you can to jump conclusions, to. Matt. Speaking of comedy, yeah, and he's and hilarious maybe, too. Maybe once you're coming out of your coma, I'll be coming out of jail. And guess what? I'll split your fucking head open again because I don't give a fuck about jail. I suspect Nikki was going to get his money back. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. No, but it, it, it's funny that you mentioned that though, because he does mention like this idea that the banker was a regular Joe, a citizen, like he was going right. to go straight to the FBI. Right, that right. also reminded me a lot of the Elroyan world, where it's like you've got people that aren't in the game, and uh, there are different rules that should apply. Um, but of course, Nikki's blurring those lines all the time, right? Yeah, because of his uh, doesn't give a fuck about anything attitude. And even to the point where he's like bucking the rules with uh, the bosses back home, Remo Gaji and all these guys. Remo, yeah. All, <laughs> all, the, yeah. all the guys with, I don't know, emphysema or whatever. What they do they do? Sit in the back of that restaurant all day waiting for like money? We can't have it. No receipts. No receipts. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to pay taxes? <laughs> But again, how great are the shots when the bosses are introduced, right? There's that right. great portrait shot of them that al- almost looks like... Um, well, they're in the middle of talking, and then they like stop and turn around and look at the camera real so, quick. Oh, so yeah. cool. And they all just kind of freeze. Yeah, that you know kind of sets the tone for the visual style of the film, and it um, kind of gives this sense that there is this source of power and influence and money yeah. that imposes its will on the world but is a little nebulous right i mean we kind of know they're in kansas city but like nikki says they're really far away and he doesn't know anybody that can see that far yeah (laughs) (laughs) but just another great beautiful shot to introduce uh characters in the movie Uh, we should bring up uh you brought up robert richardson before but um some of the the gags that they pull in this movie like that pov shot of the straw taking the cocaine and it's like this big right. close up of that. How the hell they did that, I have no idea, but it was like so impactful. Probably took forever to set up, and it's in there for like, you know, a split second, but it's so powerful. It, it's wild. You know, and it, it has that beauty that you're talking about, Andy, where it's like the sort of classic Robbie Richardson style of it's like totally blown out, and then you've got the filter on the lens that like, you know, has it kind of right. bloom. And, and um, you know, it, it makes it look like the way you'd think to shoot a fantasy or, or some kind of like, right. yes, exactly. You know, like legend. Uh, it looks like Ridley legend. Scott's I was about legend. to say, yeah, legend yeah. or like, you know, never ending story or one exactly. of these things, but he's taking it and applying it to something that was, you know, it's very stylish, uh, but it's very gritty and it's, it's, it's sort of like very realistic in the way people are behaving with one another. And right. so it, like it, it makes you, you feel a little disoriented while you're, while you're in the whole world. Like you're just like spinning the whole time. Yeah, this movie feels dreamy or that you're in kind of a haze um, or dream yeah. state possibly due to, you know, being in Vegas for a long time. I mean, that, it's, a, <laughs> it's a really good effect. Yeah, and it applies perfectly to Vegas, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's exactly. It's kind of the the uh, lights and glimmer of Vegas. It, it kind of covers up the, the underbelly of what's actually going on. And you have this, I think that imagery is an idealized, you say, we say dreamy. It's idealizing the world that really is darker and more sordid underneath and more complicated right and and in a way that really is a metaphor for how scorsese presents a lot of the characters involved in the mob world where it's this there there's this idea that on on some level um they've got style and they carry themselves really really well but they're and 
maybe they're good family men or they care about things that we can get behind. But ultimately, they're doing things that, you know, um, morally we disagree with they're or crooks. we understand. Yeah, they're, they're doing crimes or things that ultimately we, we anticipate will lead to some amount of tragic downfall to varying degrees. So yeah. I, I felt like him teaming up with Robert Richardson in this movie um, was just perfect, right? Uh, it's a perfect choice, perfect way to go. Yeah, and I was, I, I, I mean, I, I, I knew this and I just, you know, made sure, but th- he did that similar thing in Inglorious Bastards with the milk. And at the very beginning of the, of the movie with the milk that's sitting in the middle of the table, he's making it basically glow. Um, right. With that right. one. I mean, it must have been one special light on there. Just, like, <laughs> um, But yeah, I mean, like that's something that you wouldn't see in nature. A lot of the things or you wouldn't see in just s- sitting around the house. But, you know, yeah. he brings such good attention to it. And it's still a movie, right? It should still look and feel like different than looking through a window. Well, yeah. And, and it, but he, he gets rid of the like, take this movie and compare it to. Goodfellas, right? Like the just the like the look and and style of it. Like some some of the styles the same with the like I- insane uh, coked up energy of the movie, where it's like just the whip you know, cameras, whip cams, whip pans. You know all all, all that stuff that the the insane you know oneers and those little sequences, but also just like the little things that he does, where it's like when Nikki throws that card at that dealer and it like lands on his shirt and sticks, and like the the camera just like pushes in two feet in like half a second and it's like whoa you know <laughs> these little like flares it's like, how you the know. hell did they do that this is this is the one that chrissy watched of the two um and, uh-huh. and that was like her most like shocked scene was when how the hell they did how they do that i'm like that was definitely luck I don't... <laughs> right. and the, the ultimate praise for the movie too is just how much this movie influenced a lot of uh, subsequent filmmakers, right? You could see a lot of influence in P.T. Anderson. I was just thinking Soderbergh, like a lot of the, mm. even though Ocean's Eleven is way different tone and a lot lighter and more fun, a lot of the moving through the casino. Similar I mean, montage shots. And, and you, you can't help but have been influenced by Scorsese on this one, right? It's uh, yeah. it's really great to see that. Yeah, I mean, especially like, you know, Boogie Nights, I think is what you're, talking about there like you know like the way that the world is just like you know sort of hypnotic and kind of like swirling the whole time frenetic yeah i I think the uh i think the scene where uh dirk and um (laughs) i can't think of john c Riley's name in that when they're going for for coke and there's those quick push-ins of like the phone ringing and he's like did you get it uh, and yeah. like the first time he's like, oh, right. you're, you're right on time. And the second one was like, where the fuck have you been so long? You know, like <laughs> just this ramp up of, uh, of excitement. Um, but yeah, I fight that a lot in casino too. Well, and, and then you, <laughs> also that idea of like the city and the, the drugs and, every, and, the, and the life kind of getting to him. It's like you saw how Nikki got sloppy yeah. uh, with a lot of this stuff. I fucked up, Frankie. I fucked up good this time. She never started with this fucking broad. That was an interesting contrast because like in something like Goodfellas, the Nikki and the Tommy characters are, are pretty similar, the Joe Pesci uh, roles. However, like, you never saw Tommy get sloppy in that same way or, like, you know, start to lose it or, you know, betray his friends in the same way. And, you know, it, it really makes the whole interpersonal story is a lot more tragic. You know, like the way that Sam, Nikki, and Ginger were all, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's like a band that breaks up uh, type of thing. Yeah. And this movie, although it feels like you um, feel the the Henry Hill tragedy a little more because it's it's more explicit with his voiceover at the end about uh, egg noodles and ketchup and uh, <laughs> all this stuff, and how in contrast at the end of Casino he's just talking about like well if you order room service you'll be lucky if you get it by Tuesday or whatever. It's not the same level of loss, but the personal loss you feel a lot more in Casino. I feel like you know, his weakness with is like sort of Achilles heel with Ginger, his uh, betrayal by Nikki. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, all, of course, all the status and power and whatever, all of that gets lost. And it's one of those things where it's, it's not even about a choice that he made to save his own bacon the way that Henry Hill did. I actually think you feel the tragedy more in this one because, because of the great job that they did in really focusing on the, how complex his relationship with Ginger and, and how you really did get the yeah, sense that this, despite him being that's what I was a, getting at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, despite him being cold, calculated, and very logical person, you could tell that he really loved Ginger 
almost to the point of irrationality, right? Yeah. Totally. And you feel it in the sense, and it's, you know, in, in the very much a style, like the way he expresses that is that, you know, after she's found dead, he has somebody else do an autopsy. And so you, you get the sense that, uh, you know, he really wanted to find out what happened to her, right? So it's, right. you get the sense that he was really affected by that. And not just that, but then you have visually De Niro's performance. I think that hollowness in a way, I think was just a lot more tragic. I mean, with with Henry Hill, there's there's this regret and a yearning from the good old days, but there is still a little bit of a kind of a wink at the end, right? But I feel like with with Ace Rothstein, you know, like you said, he's really hollowed out in it, and you feel that tragedy uh, a lot right. more. Well, and and then even with the with the Henry character, he's talking about all these things that he misses about the life, you know, Oh, I had a fishbowl full of Coke by the bed. And you know, I had a, a half a dozen safe houses and if anything I wanted, I could just steal it and blah, blah. And in a way, what he's talking about is sort of discordant with what we were seeing. I mean, he, he was expressing all this like freedom that he once had as a, as a gangster, but you never actually saw that. Like you, everything you saw him in was like this, like very tight, world that like you know you couldn't step out of bounds right if he made fun of tommy in, in the wrong way maybe he would have been killed at the bamboo uh lounge or whatever that was right it's like everything he's saying is this like false sense of nostalgia that he's feeling for for a time that never existed like from what we uh, were shown whereas the way that the sam character felt about uh, ginger based on all of his actions and even you know everything that he was doing like he couldn't let her go he was acting irrationally like you're saying andy because like you know the heart wants what the heart wants type of thing and the brain has no say over that you know for, for the guy who's the most calculating guy in the world this is the like the one thing that he uh, couldn't calculate on and it's and it's the most kind of profound flaw tragic flaw for a character that is so obsessive about controlling everything and understanding he's kind of like the neil mccauley character he has to uh, no. you know un- understand every angle before he goes into something <laughs> here he kind of throws himself into this marriage uh you know presumably uh, you got an- the wrong girl exactly like you know ginger being straight up she, that it she, wasn't yeah exactly work. she tells him <laughs> and yet yet he convinces himself like he's in convincing her he's kind of convincing himself that they could kind of make it work right and it's he kind of throws himself head first into this relationship uh I mean, in their on their wedding night, he catches her, you know, talking, talking to, to James, James Woods. Woods and being manipulated by him, and it's you, you just know that that that's just a train wreck waiting to happen, right? It's it, it adds that discomfort where you know that this is gonna all come up to a boil, and it's the whole movie's kind of like a powder keg, right? And it's like yeah. who's gonna blow up first? Is it gonna be mm-hmm. Ginger? Is it gonna be Nikki? Is it gonna be the bosses coming down on them? Is it gonna be the cops? The gaming board? It's they're coming at you from all sides, you know? I, I feel the relationship with Ginger was more for Sam Rothstein's benefit. She didn't want any of that. She didn't want to be locked down to that. She was very happy being that little starlet that would run around Vegas, right, and be known as this, like, popular girl. And then he right. wanted to tie her down, have a kid, do this stuff, and do, the, like, the family thing. She never wanted any of that, but I think that that was, you know, more for him. It kind of brought up uh, Citizen Kane to me, you know, trying to turn that his, his love into a songbird. You know, yeah. just for him as opposed to, you know, you know, he wanted her to be a normal wife with a normal mother, you know, and take care mm-hmm. of his kids. But on, on his terms, on mean, his yeah, terms. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And I think, Jeremy, what you said about the the difference between the ending of Goodfellas and Casino, it's actually a very good point. There is this irony in uh, Henry Hill regretting the, the life he left behind because you're right. It is a false sense of nostalgia. I mean, the whole movie he's beholding to to something. Whether it's it's the life, it's the the cops, it's the drugs. Like, there's always right. something. It's conf- all the unspoken rules and exactly. Yeah, and that. he's really facing danger from all sides. And um, you know, the freedom lies in that kind of lawlessness, the ability, presumably, to do whatever you want and, and get away with it. But that kind of catches up with you. Here, there's in Casino, there's more of a tragedy in the sense that <laughs> the tragedy to me just begins with him be reunited with Nikki in Vegas. I mean, I felt like it was kind of like you take this neat freak uh, roommate and you yep. team him up with the roommate that's just going to show up the and party all the time. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and you oh, just Felix. Know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he, but he didn't want him to come out. I mean, he told him flat out, or as as best as he could, tell Nikki. Nikki I wasn't going to hear that out. He, he's yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> I mean, he told him flat out. He's like, he's like, you know, you got to keep a low profile out here. People are after you. You know, you got to do this he, the right way. And even the cops <laughs> aren't worried about digging a hole in the desert or whatever. It says. <laughs> There's a lot of holes in the desert. <laughs> but you got to go out there and dig it in the first place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because otherwise somebody else may come along and <laughs> yeah. next thing you know, yeah. you're digging two or three holes. <laughs> <laughs> and you're liable to be there all night. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, those locations they got in the desert were awesome. I've yeah. been to Vegas a lot. I don't know that I've wandered that far off the strip. <laughs> yeah, a couple that's... hundred yards down the road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like you, you were talking about like some of those, um, those moments, like where, where we're meeting all the bosses and they all sort of turn and like, you know, there's this theatricality about it. It almost looks, um, like the 12 apostles, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of famous like painting, a Baroque painting. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it's not realistic at all, despite the fact that, you know, most of these moments between characters when they're talking and, and everything else like feels so real. Uh, and then there's all these like, you know, flourishes both, you know, sort of cinematically and then also just uh, th- with some of the, the sort of you know, theatrical staging of things sometimes. And for me, first watching this movie, th- this is the first Scorsese movie I'd seen. and Ever? Ever. And it just, it blew my mind. I, I, I didn't even know what I was looking at. You know, it was, it was just like, it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. It was one of those things where I it was the first time that I understood that there was like authorship behind movies. And when I watched it, it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. I, I couldn't get enough of it. I watched, you know, like a, a, a dozen times uh, again before returning the, the rental and all this stuff. But um, I thought that I had kind of fallen in love with the mafia world that, that was in the movie, but it wasn't, it was that like, like the, the movie making experience or whatever was was uh what was what it was that was like really drawing me in and then you know from there i ended up ravenously consuming all of uh scorsese's stuff to try and like uh get a sense of of where all this like came from but it was like this one is just uh although maybe now after this conversation i feel like casino may have leapfrogged goodfellas in terms of uh, being the better the better movie you heard it here. uh quote unquote for the longest time i would i was always say like okay goodfellas is probably the better movie but casino was my favorite but I, I think you're right andy i think there is a lot to be said about the tragedy in this and the actual tragedy not just the uh perceived or nostalgic tragedy of the uh you know no more good uh, pasta uh, uh, yeah <laughs> egg noodles and ketchup yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah it's I want to add to what you're saying because I remember I saw Goodfellas first when I was really, really young. And I remember (laughs) being a little frightened by the movie, actually. A little, yeah. Yeah, just because of the violence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, But Casino, I mean, I think it has one of my favorite Scorsese montages at the end of the film. I mean, the way the movie ends, um, I think really... It captures the tone, the t- perfectly the tone of the film. With the house of the rising sun, but or like also, are you talking about like the casinos yeah, coming down? Exactly. Yeah. And you see, uh, you know, the aftermath of the the whole world, their whole house of cards crumbling, and then it, there's that great moment where Nikki's, you know, picking up his voiceover about how he's bringing his brother to this meet, and then it gets interrupted by <laughs> right. you know, being whacked by a bat and uh, and getting. Uh, Frankie getting his revenge for Goodfellas. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, it encompasses that, but it also captures this, this mob world that Scorsese represents. And um, it, it really just shows you that for as fun as it can be, as beautiful as it could be at times, um, there's a darkness and there's a violence and there's a finiteness to it. It's mm-hmm. not something that right. uh, can go on forever. The fun's going to end. Way, <laughs> exactly. Much in the same way that, that Vegas had to change and, Vegas evolved from its origins. Um, uh, a lot of these characters um, 
get left behind. And in a way, again, going back to this idea of being in El Royan world, um, they become footnotes in the history of Vegas, right? And that's there, there's a tragedy to that that I think is captured perfectly by that montage. And additionally, I think I I think it was in the the previous episode, Jeremy, you summed up like Scorsese style really well, where you said that that his films and specifically his uh, gangster or mobster saga, like mm-hmm. they um, are so powerful because they're very stylized, very personal. There's this um, kind of awareness of the power of cinema, but they still never lose their authenticity about the subject matter. And in Casino, you totally felt that. For as theatrical right. as the introduction was of all the characters, they felt very real, right? There's this kind of strange coincidence that, you know, uh, Joe Pesci happens to look a lot like the character he was based on, uh-huh. <laughs> Anthony Spilotro. Like, it was crazy. And watching uh, some of the footage uh, of the real character in the featurette, I was, like, amazed how much he kind of happens to look like him. And even even De Niro looks a little bit like the, the real character he was based on. But the authenticity comes from the performances. It comes from what you often hear people talk about the genius of Scorsese, which is that his attention to detail, like you get a sense that he knows this world. I'm always wondering how many of the, the, these types of characters Scorsese actually interacted with, because you, you feel like that authenticity there, it never loses that, right? Like um, mm. for as uh, complicated and as impressive as Ginger's character is, you, you totally believe her and, you don't sit there questioning, well, why is she even hanging out with James Woods, right? I mean, you understand that someone can have that flaw, someone that's so used to being and struggling to survive in the world alone and hustling yeah. um, and but, hustling to but survive. But also her, her uh, relationship to James Woods is similar to De Niro's relationship to her, where it's like he irrationally uh, cares for her and she irrationally cares for uh, Lester Diamond. Do, do the voice again. You, you did the voice in a previous episode. <laughs> Can you feel me in the pity of stomach? <laughs> Can you feel me in the heart? You're the stupid 13-year-old kid with the braces. Okay, I'm in. You, you know I'm with you. Um, talk to you later. Bye. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> the, the pity. The pity of stomach. Don't make me come there. <laughs> He's such Dance a fucking slime ball in that movie, man. I love you. But, but, but baby... Do you, do you know that I love you too? Yeah. <laughs> he's like he's like doing blow offs. On... <laughs> yeah, with the girl, the other girl walking in, she she takes a line right off. Yeah, you know I love you, right? <laughs> but what resonates with these characters that are so different than my life experience, your life experience, is that like for example, for Ginger, or like you said, even with Ace, it's like this emotional dependency where you're relying on someone else for your happiness. Yeah. whether or not that person wants to give it to you is giving it to you is treating you like shit like and so that authenticity i think is really what what holds the the keeps the drama what propels your interest in the film like as theatrical gets as wild as the camera gets you're always still grounded in the fact that like you're uncomfortable because you don't want to see ace you know ruin such a good thing because you know you just brought in this powder keg wedding that exploded nikki and Ginger has a good thing going. She has finally has everything she's ever wanted, but that's not enough, right? I mean, you can't mm-hmm. keep it out. So all those things, I think, make the movie super powerful, all while being very stylized, very unique, not kind of bland. I mean, it's not like a Wikipedia entry. I mean, this is Scorsese's perspective or portrayal right. of these characters, right? Right. I, I, and, and I guess you can say that about I guess all four out of five of these movies where they are, you know, based on true events or whatever, like it isn't just um, the moment by moment, beat by beat uh, facts of what happened. You know, they're, they're extremely stylish and, you know, kind of like I was saying earlier, like, I mean, like this one in particular took a lot of that to the next level. I mean, you see him like go crazy in, in, uh, in uh, Raging Bull. You see him go crazy again and sort of top it. In Goodfellas, and he, and he sort of tops it again in, in Casino in terms of just like the amount of just like cinematic flourishes and and uh, you know a- almost unnecessary camera moves like that <laughs> that push in on the uh, on the blackjack dealer and and you know and four hundred other examples <laughs> and it's like it just it creates that effect that uh, Karen was talking about at her wedding in Goodfellas where she's like you know just at the end of the night you just feel dizzy right it's like you're, you're the whole right. time. 
you, you, you can't even keep up with it. And like, there's like so many names and so many things going on. Um, the dealers are watching the box men. The box men are watching the pit bosses. The... <laughs> and and the everyone's the getting watched by the eye in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, that's a good point. Like what this, what his style accomplishes really is in charming you and seducing you by the life. And it's right. perfect seduction, right? Because um, you really don't want to be a part of the life. You don't want to condone any of it, but you're kind of seduced by the glitz and glamour. And, and again, that's why I think Vegas ends up being like a, a perfect setting for his follow-up to, to Goodfellas um, and uh, his mob saga, right? I mean, it's got a lot of that element. Um, what's interesting in watching Goodfellas recently and then Casino is just, it's so great if you take this, you could either look at it as trilogy or saga if you include Mean Streets and Raging Bull, but this idea that with every film and with him taking a style and um, skill and craft as a filmmaker to the next level, he was also kind of working his way up the mob ladder, right? So mm-hmm. it's like with Mean Streets, you have these guys at the very bottom Low at the level. street level just trying to survive. You know, in Goodfellas, you have people in that world trying to come up trying to get made um but ones that couldn't get made too you're following those right (laughs) right (laughs) right and then in casino you have these you know middle operators that are very important what they do have a certain amount of weight in the world around them so they control a lot of vegas but ultimately they're still really beholding to the orders that come from the bosses Mm -hmm. middle management but you know nikki has a lot of aspirations right exactly and and additionally to that there's this interesting idea that they represent the kind of next generation of gangsters in a way that mm-hmm. are uh, reacting against the rules, are kind of trying to buck the system and the hierarchy um, that of these highly organized, highly structured criminal enterprises. And a lot of the tragedy and a lot of their um, downfall is a result of that. So what's interesting is we transition now into The Irishman, which is now you get a story that's more from the point of view of a lot of the people higher up making a lot of the decisions, right? Um, n- maybe not the highest level, and it's always kind of questionable to say who's actually uh, pulling the strings when you get to the very top. But, you know, with with Russell Buffalino, you, you've got a very powerful person that gets to carry out and make a lot of important decisions. You have Jimmy Hoffa, obviously, that controlled um, the Teamsters. And so it just works so well that as he kind of endeavors into – maybe the last chapter in the gangster saga, um, he kind of reaches to the higher level and you have these characters that um, actually survive into the older age and kind of get to look back and reflect back upon that lifestyle. Right, exactly. I mean, <laughs> like, I think this is the first time... No, I mean, because Ace Rothstein, you know, gets to be older... Yeah, but we don't get to see the, the arthritic version of our right, leads right, right. Um, as we do in, in, in The Irishman. And I don't mean to go all the way to the end, but I mentioned this to you before. But talking about performances and, and Pesci specifically in The Irishman, um, watching him in his last kind of scenes in this film, I mean, you could feel the arthritis pain in his hands. You could feel like he was hard to breathe. And Well, when, when he was like dipping his bread in grape juice or whatever. Yeah. At, at the very end when he was dipping yeah, his yeah. bread yeah. in grape juice. Yeah, because they do that at the beginning too in the, the wine, right? Uh, yeah. That's kind of how they, they break bread together. Um, but um, when you see him just walk away and he's like, I'm going to go to church now. And he's like, he just went to church. <laughs> You'll and see. And then he went to You'll the hospital yeah. and then he died. Yeah, and, but it was just... Um, some of these, the performances again, like I want to say, like I was kind of putting this movie off. I think I was turned off again by the CG work, the de-aging and all that. Um, and I remember, you know, when I first turned the movie on, I'm like, is this going to, um, you know, get to me? Is this going to be distracting? The first shot really is distracting to me specifically when, uh, (laughs) Sheeran is driving that truck. I I feel like I'm just like taken out of that scene, Uh, but other than the the first shot of the CGI, Exactly. Uh, aging. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But other than that, no, totally. But other than that, this movie succeeded on all fronts and um, just a, a wonderful like collaboration of all these folks that were in all the movies that we, we were looking at for this podcast, uh, you yeah. know, block um, all come together in some of their best roles. And then a few new ones, too, um, which, you know, again, um, the other Buffalino, uh, Ray Romano. Yeah. Um, right. He was 
amazing in this you know like right, again right. he's got a, we got another comedian that's kind of in in one of these roles and that's true that's true fantastic yeah i didn't think that's interesting yeah i didn't think about and, that. and greg norton playing don rickles you know so <laughs> they had the rickles connection yeah, to, yeah, yeah. no exactly like there there's such a um marty cinematic universe here of like you know <laughs> all these like connections with like <laughs> You know, uh, the guy who's like, hey, you want to see helicopters? I'll show you helicopters. Like, you know, he, he's, he plays Whispers. Yeah. And, uh, you the know, Whispers and, kill. Whispers. No, the other Whispers. Oh, right. right? And right, like, right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was trying to think, where do I recognize him from? Right, 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 right. right. I love what he, yeah, the other Whispers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you, you just get all these all these like pieces of the puzzle coming together. I mean, he's like, also in Casino, you know, isn't he? Isn't he one of the betters yeah. uh, that's like following um, uh, Ace's one of Ace's lines or whatever? Yeah, no, exactly, mean? exactly. Yeah, 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 right, right. When he sets the the odds the around odds, the very beginning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so obviously, you see a lot of uh, the <laughs> Martin Scorsese uh, radio pictures uh, players exactly. uh, in, in this <laughs> like. <laughs> type of thing where it's like you mercury know, theater yeah <laughs> you, you, you get all these guys that you know he's worked with before and you know harvey Keitel obviously and then oh. uh de niro and pesci well and... he wanted that he wanted that apparently he wanted that uh close-up of hoffa talking to harvey Keitel's character uh because i guess he had never been on screen before oh okay really right at, at, during the like the uh the award dinner or whatever it was the uh you know it's the way it is award dinner yeah yeah well, they're up in the balcony, and they're, you get the sense that, that the way it's worked into the story is that there's, they're kind of on edge to see if that's going to blow up because it's Hoffa kind of approaching the mob that he was at odds with at that point in the movie. But yeah, um, which I had to stop and think about that, but that sounds correct, right? That the, they've never been on screen together? Probably not. I mean, I, I can't think of a time. Um, but, you know, there's a bunch of other little connections, too, of like, Lois, I I don't fly without my lucky hat. Was playing Jimmy's wife. <laughs> yeah, and like um, you Wait, know, I gotta drive oh, to go get Lois. Oh, you're you're right. Yeah. Right? I, yeah. Oh my gosh, I totally. And it's funny as I yeah, I just watched it a couple of days ago. That's right. And, and she's one of the one of the actors from Goodfellas that I would never have thought that he'd put in another movie. Right. And when I right. saw her in The Irishman, I was like, oh wow, I knew her right away. I was like, oh, that's the lucky hat. The, <laughs> yeah. the guy who like hands de niro the like uh little metal seal to put on the truck at the at the uh at the beginning uh was pescano from that, casino i know i know he could uh, screw up a cup of coffee <laughs> <laughs> then i can take another I couple love, grand to I, go back I, to I, love, I love that rapport with scorsese's mom in the, in the deli yeah <laughs> i write it all down in this book every fucking nickel goes down right hey, here receipts oh, here. Wow, receipts here, bills here everything's here screw around with those suitcases and i'll take the eyes out of his freaking the- head Again, I didn't crush this a freaking head. That's enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, well, of course, we got you know a fictional Don Rickles uh, who was in uh, Casino, and then the guy who was Joe Pesci's brother Dominic in Casino had some uh, small role as like the jeweler whose son was fucking up, and like uh, Russell like, kind of chewed him out a little oh, bit Go, right. on their cross country trip right, to collect right, money. Right, right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but but then you know like so Scorsese directed the pilot of Boardwalk Empire. And there was a ton of Boardwalk Empire people in this. The right. Bobby Cannavale, the uh, Stephen Graham, the guy who played RFK, uh, Jack Houston. Oh right, Pro Joe, uh, Pro whatever. Uh, yeah, Joe, Pro Stephen Graham. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And he's yeah. a he's a British guy, isn't he? Yeah. Do you like Degs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I Do like. Do you dogs. mean dog? I like that, that Caravans guy. more. Yeah, he, yeah. he was great in Boardwalk Empire. Though. Yeah. He was uh, he was awesome. Capone. Yeah, he was yeah. great in that. But uh, Dominic. Uh, Lombardazzi or whatever his name is, Herc from The Wire, right? He was yeah. also in. Uh, he was Capone's brother in uh, in Boardwalk. Sebastian Maniscalco, another comedian playing um, uh, Joey Joey Gallo, uh, Joey the Crazy. Oh what? yes, yes, right. That, that was another comedian, right? Yeah. All right, totally, mm-hmm. totally. There's all there. There's um, also the that other actor from The Wire who's trying to get the money for the Dunes Hotel. Remember to, for the right, for, uh, and which is. Uh, he, he, he played uh, one of the Greeks or whatever in uh... <laughs> exactly exactly which is actually a, one of the points I wanted to make is it's also great that you guys picked these two movies because um, as I was watching Casino because I watched The Irishman first as I watched Casino I forgot that the the whole storyline of the Teamsters right. finding the casino right, right, right. <laughs> so actually there's this nice tie in with the Teamsters and the, the fund and the, 
the mob controlling that. It's great. Now, what's interesting about the Irishman is that it, you know it's called the Irishman. Um, it's based on a book called "I Heard You Paint Houses," and then it's titled "I Heard You Paint Houses" in, in the, the movie. film. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Like at no point do they put up the title card, "The Irishman." Right. I I don't remember seeing that, <laughs> and I don't even remember seeing that like at the end. But I mean, that's a it's a front and center, you know, big Scorsese uh, title right. card, you know, as they're I like heard driving. You paint house. Yeah. Well, it's actually broken yeah, it's up, like right? Broken it's up, I, yeah. I heard you paint houses. Uh, but so but, so impactful, right? The way that, that right. Yeah. No, I, actually, it does. It does say at the very end, uh, like the Irishman, and then after that, it says, "I heard you paint houses." So it's like, <laughs> you know, what's the title of this movie? <laughs> I actually thought about this a lot because "I heard you paint houses" is a very cool title it's a very interesting title because it's lingo that i'd never heard of in and from what i read mm-hmm. it wasn't very typical in, within i never the mob heard world that. itself it's it's one of the things that may have been very specific to this group of people right in, Phil- in, in philadelphia Philly. and so it's a great title uh but i also think the irishman's a great title too because it's his nickname yeah. you know they do call him irish and it's him movie. it's about him and it's yeah it's, so i'm kind of torn on that because they're both, they would both be great titles, right? Um, but I think the way that they define what that means when you paint houses right after they they say it in the movie, and this dude gets gets plastered in that house, and right, there is right. red blood everywhere. Like it's, <laughs> oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> now, was that supposed to be someone that we see in the movie? I, it's not Hoffa, right? I don't it's think not... that no, because Hoffa gets taken out in that little uh the the hallway vestibule, of the, or the, yeah, the uh, vestibule yeah. yeah yeah but the blood gets on the like the corner of the door is that's what i'm saying right. like it looks like a reverse shot of what you how you see hoffa getting shot maybe right but it's that, that that's I don't know, interesting I, that'd be worth uh rewatch to see because they it's <laughs> so fast that i feel like it could be yeah. but i saw it you know twice in the theater when it came out i you know i i, I like you brian like when i first heard about this movie and like the de-aging and i was like oh man Oh fuck this! Like, it, it, it this is really gonna suck, and like it, it's gonna be it's gonna be terrible. It's gonna look like, you know, Beowulf or the Polar yes. Express or whatever. The eyes looking in the wrong direction. And right. Yeah. <laughs> but like, hate that. You know, and and the very first shot when you see him in that truck, I was like, oh shit! Yeah. Like it, it's gonna look like this the whole time. And like, at the very beginning, it's still a little rough, but it really uh, settles into it. At least in terms of the face, like you're you're not as uh, turned off by it, you know. After the, those first couple shots, yeah, it helped that he settled into the age that he was supposed to be too. After a while, you know, <laughs> well, like <laughs> well, definitely for the for the last uh, half an hour or whatever right. that was, where he was playing you know, roughly his own age. But um, anyway, when when it was coming out, I it was it was it was playing around town for a little bit. I saw it at the Egyptian twice, and it was sold out. Like you know, every showing there, it was nuts. And this is the first time I watched it at home, the way uh, Netflix intended. Uh, only, <laughs> only it was off of a Blu-ray. So so, so ironic that Scorsese, <laughs> this big picture that Scorsese did, came out on Netflix, and his his like hatred of streaming and you know like anti-cinema is just like it's it's amazing. Right, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's um, that I, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but um, yeah, <laughs> the fascinating thing was like you know how much it it sort of it sort of worked and how much it, you could feel the audience getting into it in in the, the theater. But anyway, the, the reason I kind of brought that up was like the first two times I saw it, I saw it in the theater and like couldn't rewind it. Like I was curious, was that supposed to be Hoffa? I uh, frame by framed it uh, today. Okay, uh, and it kind of looks like him. I don't know. Is is it supposed to be him with de aging? Because it, it looks like maybe. 80s era Al Pacino in that moment, but it could also just be some other anonymous dude getting whacked. It's like, it's not clear. I feel like that's got to be very intentional. And it works well because I think I, I watched it a couple times and I didn't make that connection till this time around. I think also I didn't quite get what, you know, like the I heard you paint houses. Like, I also didn't, never heard that expression. The first couple times I watched it, I was like, what is that? like a common expression. I mean, it makes sense. I understand visually what it means, but like, you know, I also do my own carpentry. I didn't get that one right, right off the bat. And then, and now <laughs> I, I thought get that was it. just a quippy like, response, right? Yeah, exactly. No, no, it, it, it actually was supposed to have meaning that like he gets rid of the body too. Right. Right. Oh, um, see. Yeah. 
yeah. but which is something you actually don't see in the you, movie. You, That's why you don't I, get that I, out of the movie. No, for sure. You don't no. get that out of the movie. That's why I never put that together till um, I was reading a little bit about it. But because the only getting rid of the body was Hoffa that I remember in this movie. Uh, through no, the, but he it, didn't. He didn't. Yeah, get he rid didn't of the even body. do it. Yeah, those yeah, two yeah. other dudes did. Yeah. So. So it's interesting the, that, but I feel like it's very intentional and it's great that it is because it's so fast. It's a little bit of that flair, but it's, it's, it's also this like kind of foreshadowing, right? Like very brief glimpse of, and it creates also this sense of, of subjective perspective. That's the other thing that, you know, the film has, right? Cause it's all being told from its perspective. So I think that works really great. And it's, mm-hmm. it's great that it's kind of amb- ambiguous. And, and in a way it, 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 it could be a false story, right? Because we don't necessarily know what happened to Hoffa. No one does. So this perspective of this guy killing Hoffa could be totally yeah. fictionalized, right? Or he, he made this yeah. up. It, yeah, it definitely could be I, like, I think, the most satisfying reading of the movie, however, is that like it it is all real because of it, like the oh, way it's it, very satisfying reading of the movie. His yeah. guilt uh, yeah. weighed on him in his uh, latter days. Plus, the way that that Sheeran takes out people in that he he's almost throwing bullets at people. You know, when he takes <laughs> yeah. out whispers and he takes out right. uh, Hoffa, man, it's just like he's like whipping a bullet in their face. Yeah, I mean, you, you know the Hoffa thing's coming. You know it's coming. You know it's coming. And then when it happens, yeah. you're still surprised. It, it got it's me. Like, it totally yeah. fucking got yeah, me, Yeah, but it, it, feels very, it feels very real. It's not yeah. sensational. That That's the other thing that... Um, that's one thing that I really like about the movie is that everything about the movie is uh, very refined in a way like it's... The violence is not sensational um i mean i think there's an element of sensational violence in in casino you know like yes. the head in the vice and mm-hmm. the way that's shot and the way it luxuriates and the gore and the baseball a bit bats and more yeah. yeah um but this yeah one, like i mean he, one of like the... like a good example being in that scene where frankie's wielding two baseball bats at the same time <laughs> as if like the, that that's effective at all yeah. right and it's like, <laughs> that's not making it easier on him actually um, but in here it just felt very real right it also felt sober and not idealized right it mm-hmm. it, it felt raw yeah i think a great example I, mean, I keep bringing this up but it was like my favorite kill in the movie was was that guy whispers um it, it <laughs> yeah. was done yeah it was so it, shocking it was done with a pan and that was it it was it was a pan or it was like a still on whispers we pan over we see frank walking we follow frank in pop pop he shoots him and it just follows frank walking he's like you know, i, I don't know which way you're gonna come you're gonna come this way you're gonna come that bam, bam, what right do do yeah. I mean, just like that, and it, that that felt real to me. That felt like how it would how it would go down. It wouldn't be this like big dramatic discussion, and you know, like right, baseball exactly. bats, a big fight. No, it would be very pop, cold, pop, done, yeah, and 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 remote about it. You know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and going back to the visual styles, that's what was I think really wonderful about this movie is that, and and it's kind of a great final chapter if it ends up being is that it's not as obviously stylized as some of his other films it takes a kind of slower pace slower approach more formal in a way and yet it still has that stylized i mean like one of my favorite sequences is the crazy joe sequence uh, yeah. and just that that whole mm-hmm. start of like that that slow motion shot of of um that i think it's a public figure being shot like all set to that that runs that that song that kind of runs through the whole sequence that ends up with him is that a um, one as well when it goes in the restaurant and comes back out when she's well, a what, couple shots when he's being actually assassinated at umberto's yeah that, that's what it is but like andy's talking about like when we're seeing the guy that crazy joe had killed which is another boss at gotcha. some yes. italian american festival or whatever it was yeah i mean that, that whole sequence starts with that um, but it's done in such a way where you see people's slow motion reactions of the shooting. It cuts back to right, I think, everyone's a little like bit more... reaching for the God, gun really that slow. Was, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it cuts back to like <laughs> some, f- yeah, it cuts back to like the trial sequence where it just shows how, uh, they take the fifth. You know, it, no, no. Where oh. he just like makes the joke about the carpet. It just shows that, you know, he, he has a complete disdain for authority and, um, <laughs> he's just completely reckless and, and you know, and he dates movie stars. I mean, what's up with that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who does that, right? That's something you don't do. I yeah. mean, what's uh, up but with then that? It cut, <laughs> but then it cuts back and it shows the guy getting executed and it shows the level of violence that Crazy Joe's capable of. Then it cuts back to the dinner, uh, to the, I think it's his birthday celebration. Yeah. At the Copacabana, by the way. Yeah, which at is the, it, in with Rachel Bull and with uh, Rickles, Goodfellas. Yeah. 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 
And that great exchange, <laughs> you know, that great exchange where he stops by and he calls out Russell for wearing the pin and, you know, um, Frank like interferes and he's like, yeah, you know, you can't talk to him like that. He's a boss. You're a boss. Yeah, we're all bosses. And, <laughs> and then that look between him and Russell, which, right. you know, I'm sure we're going to get into just the powerful performances and just the, the history and, and, and lifetime worth of friendship between the, the actors that portray these characters. But that look between them, I mean, they, you know, Russell doesn't need to say anything. And next thing you know, it's just this wonderful cut where it's just a shot of the guns laid out in the bed. And he's right. like, for a job like, like this, very you need taxi two guns. driver, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's like, it, it's, it's Scorsese at the top of, of his craft in the sense that he's bringing all the elements kind of um, of his au revoir almost and, and kind of putting them together in these sequences, but taking a, um, more subdued approach. I listened to the conversation between um, Scorsese and De Niro and Pesci and Pacino. And at the end of their conversation, they have kind of like a, a dinner style uh, conversation that he recorded. Pesci asked uh, Scorsese, like, do you feel you've gotten better at what you do? You know, presumably making movies. And what was interesting about what Scorsese said was that it's essentially what I took away with it was not so much that he got better, but it's like what's important when it comes to the storytelling became more distilled. And he talks about like really understanding the characters and how they drive the drama and the tragedy and the um, audience engagement and kind of really feeling comfortable not getting in the way of that. And I feel like that that's completely exemplified in this film perfectly because like I said, there's definitely style and flourishes in the movie, um, and yet it has that kind of formal approach. I mean, even the visual palette, um, the cinematography, mm -hmm. um, you know, it goes from a kind of more colorful kind of visual exuberance at the beginning, and slowly it kind of becomes more desaturated until it's almost black and white when we get to the, right. the twilight of their years when they're in prison. Um, but it's very, very subtle, uh, and I think it they've got like four or five uh, decades that they transition through in visual style. Um, but, you know, you're not going to see something like the opening shot of Goodfellas where you got the red stoplight, like bathing the whole image in red or, you know, like the lights in the bar, like completely bathing, you know, <laughs> bathing the color palette of the, the screen. Like mm -hmm. it, it really represents, I think, that kind of point in life, that shared history and kind of lifetimes worth of knowledge and relationships that, Scorsese and his collaborators um, really shared in putting together this movie. Well said. No, for sure. I, and there's that sort of like meta enjoyment of, you know, seeing this culmination of, uh, you know, this body of work, but also like the, the movie in and of itself, it's not just the nostalgia f for like, oh, previous Scorsese movies where he did all these things and hey don't you remember lois from goodfellas and oh don't, don't, don't remember dominic from uh from <laughs> casino you know that is not the joy you get out of it because like you know the movie itself is so strong and like you know it does such a good job of getting frank to have this dual loyalty to both jimmy and russell and get you deeply invested in that when the the inevitable tragedy you know, rears his head and, and how he has to be the one to do it. The conversation, like the, the literal like, executioner. Yeah, you're the trigger man for one of your good buddies that literally your, your daughter that doesn't like anybody loves, <laughs> you know? Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's certainly, he didn't set out to make this movie uh, as fan service, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> that's for sure. It's, um, yeah, speaking of his daughter, how great was Anna Paquin in this movie, right? Yes, I, um, for, for such I a small, really, thankless role. I and know. not many lines at all, yeah. I was really mesmerized by her screen presence. I felt like, wow, I haven't seen Anna Paquin in a lot of things, uh, but she is just a great actress, you know. Um, you kind of almost wanted to see more scenes with her in it, right? I did yeah. want to see more of her. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of hers as well, and yeah, I hadn't seen her in a while uh, in anything, so it was it was pretty interesting to see her it kind of, kind of came out of nowhere really but she was great no exactly and and like you know the the scene where she's like well why didn't you call or or you know like she's giving him shit and then like then he goes up and makes that call and the call is super painful uh when he when he calls uh 
uh, Lois or w- whatever uh, her name was in this movie, uh, Jimmy Hoffa's wife. And there's that like, again, the sort of stylistic flourish that um, is hard to uh, justify getting away with, but somehow it works, which is he picks up the, the phone. He's making this call. He's stammering. Blah, 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 I can't. Blah, blah. And then we jump cut and he's, he's going into his apology and it's not like it was a miniature sequence within this phone call scene where he was trying to find his words and he, was, he couldn't find a, what to say. And like we were jumping around in time as he was trying to come up with those things. It was just one jump, which makes it seem almost uh, like a mistake or like, you know, un- unintentional, but like it, it's very purposeful. And then also like, you know, gets you into that, you know, fractured mindset. You know, it's 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 kind of this crazy thing that like, you'd think wouldn't be a, a good cut or a good place to have that break, especially being at such an emotional time. But it, it actually, you know, <laughs> like he pulls it off. It's, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you, and going back to this idea of, you know, what's his best film or when did he reach his peak and Goodfellas between Casino, I, I like to look at the Irishman as a great part of this trilogy because you know, what's interesting is, you know, we talked about in Casino where I feel like the emotional weight and tragedy um, gets ramped up and you feel more. Well, I think he even takes that to the next level in The Irishman. Yeah. I mean, that scene specifically that you were talking about, Jeremy, was like, well, why didn't you call her? Around that scene is when he has a voiceover where he's like, my daughter never spoke to me again. And essentially, you really feel this idea that he lost two people that day. It was Hoffa, his best friend, and his daughter. And those are are the things that weigh on him for the rest of his life. And I I feel like I really feel that. And I feel like the tragedy is even more intense for this type of character, which in a way is very similar to his previous uh, movies um, in this trilogy or this um, uh, saga films, right? I mean, they're very similar, but I feel like the tragedy, it's like he figures out how to get more perspective in this world as he does more movies Mm -hmm. about it. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the sort of place we're left in. I mean, like, it's it's so brutal. You know, we spend so much time after that murder, you know, with him losing his family. He has that scene where Joe Pesci has that uh, amazing transformation to, like, the post-stroke Russell, uh, where he can't uh, dip the bread in the grape juice. Jesus. And... Russell starts to say like, oh yeah, I, I miss Jimmy. He was a good guy. It's too bad we had to do that. And then he's like, but I chose us. Fuck him. Fuck him. Right? So as far as Frank is concerned, he's the only one who feels bad about this. Yeah. Um, and then Russell dies. Uh, Frank's second wife dies. His The one daughter who will, will, will talk to him in a, in a sort of stilted and awkward way. Uh, you know, obviously doesn't show up to the nursing home. Like we, we see the, the nurse who talks to him. He's like, Oh, you have a family. That's crazy. And like, you know, obviously Peggy won't talk to him. You know, he's just completely alone. Uh, you know, he's like this, uh, giant grown baby uh, and he needs a nightlight uh, type of thing. <laughs> it's like, Need he the gets door like, open the door up. open. It's just, it's so brutal. Well, that was, that was, uh, in, in reference to what Hoffa said, right? Didn't Hoffa want the door open too? Isn't that why he said that at the end? You know, he's like, leave, leave the door open a crack. Uh, I think oh, I think that was kind of a throwback yeah, to what... I, th- I think you might be right. I didn't catch mm-hmm. that. I mean, I just understood that to be just the general fear that I well, I think it. I age. think it is, though. I, I, yeah. I think it's a dual purpose sort there. Sort of both, yeah. yeah. yeah I, that idea of being alone and, and uh, seeing kind of the finale approaching, right? I yeah. Mean, if, that's what I really felt. And I think... I think the creative choice, Scorsese, um, you know, in collaboration with with Steve, Steve Zalian and writing the story, like, made of spending so much, so, such a big chunk of the movie in the kind of post Hoffa assassination um, part of the story it was just brilliant. Because to me, that's what makes the movie so powerful. Because we rarely right. get to see that perspective of people that live this kind of life, and that's where the tragedy lies. Right. I mean, that's where when you reflect back on what you've done and you have a chance to weigh what it's cost you. I mean, Frank in the movie is 
in a way, very different type of Scorsese character because he's very much a passive character in a way. In a way, he's, you know, working for both the mob and Hoffa. He essentially is a soldier taking orders almost all the time. I mean, you know, except for the time where that scene where he beats up the grocer, he rarely um, has agency in any of the violence or criminal endeavors that he participates in. The one time he kind of goes off on his own, he almost gets himself killed by taking out uh, Doing the, the laundromat. Doing the whispers job. Yeah, exactly. Well, right. that was, the I mean, that's whispers. the Kaitel scene that we were, yeah. we were yeah. talking about. That's one of the, <laughs> that's a good Kaitel scene. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, do you know who owns that? I do. Yeah. Don't, oh, oh who? who? No, no, no I, mean, I, I don't. I own it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying I know. I'm telling yeah. you that I own it. <laughs> that must have been such a fun scene to do. Well, uh, okay, so, so so real quick, on on that note, just for a second, like, what was fascinating watching it in the theater was how moments like that, the like, no, 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 I own it, right? Like, you know, the, the sort of like, you know, uh, <laughs> you know like, uh, who's on first confusion. Exactly, that's And uh, like, all, all these things. You know, like, th- there's so many moments in the movie that they get these like big laughs or like when Joe Hoffa, the the like the Lois from uh, Goodfellas, when she goes when she gets fired, and she goes out to like turn on her car, and we've seen like six car bombs or whatever. Exactly. Like, the the entire audience like sucked in their breath when she stuck her key in, and you know there was this you know palpable tension in the room, and nobody was moving, nobody was breathing, and and it's one of those things where it's like as sort of funny and crazy as or, or or when Jimmy Hoffa was like screaming about RFK and like banging on the desk and like it's like you idiots you fucked it up <laughs> that whole scene everything about that like you know all those moments were sort of funnier and bigger and more suspenseful uh, than uh, I imagine that whatever 99% of the audience when they're watching it at home for the first time Versus, like you know, having that uh, for sure time and in, in in the theater yeah. with everybody. I'm really jealous that you got to see it twice. Um, I would have loved to have <laughs> yeah. seen this even once in the theater. I, I don't know why the hell I didn't go. Yeah, I mean the the comedy is definitely uh, comedic power is definitely something that is contagious in a movie, right? So there's there, it definitely hits a lot better when there's an audience there. Um, oh yeah, and you know, in typical Scorsese style, the the movie doesn't lack for those funny moments right i mean they're they're definitely those um throughout but going back to what i was saying about the uh frank and being more of a passive character um so he's really caught in the crosshairs Mm -hmm. of his loyalties um and his friendships and his relationships right i mean it's about his loyalty uh to russell and the mob it's his loyalty to hoffa his friends and then his loyalty and duty to his family and the way those are at odds throughout his whole life, right? And ultimately, the way that it is so tragic uh, is because he ends up, you know, choosing Russell yep. and it ends up costing him the other two. Yep. And so... Right, uh, well, and, and, and from the way he was sort of programmed early on, you know, even when he was, uh, you know, doing war crimes for General Patton in uh, World War II there... It, it wasn't as if he even had a choice necessarily, you know. Right, I mean? it, yeah. It's like he he just he had, he had to do what he had to do, and like you know, it, it, yeah. These none of these things were things he ever thought about. Like you're like you're saying, because you know, it is a passive character thing to do. I agree. I I think it, it's more accurate to say that he ends up acting in a you know in alignment with his loyalty to Russell. Now it's mm-hmm. it becomes a matter of survival, um, sure. But still, it costs him the other two uh, relationships that meant a lot. And also, you know, as Scorsese progresses in these series of films, it's like you become more invested in what the characters care about, right? So it's like you have Henry Hill, who really loves the life, presumably, and uh, perhaps there's a false sense of that, but he loves the life, and that's what he regrets more most at the end. Mm-hmm. Then you've got Ace Rothstein that really loves the casino and this um, – establishment that he kind of builds and runs on his own um his career let's say and he ends up losing that to a certain degree and although there is a personal relationship that he loses it's a little bit of a combination of both and here you know the regret is the personal relationships that it cost him right both in hoffa and in his daughter peggy specifically but most likely you know all his daughters um the relationship suffered because of it 
And perhaps he he doesn't have, you know, the ability to verbalize or really understand that. I mean, you see that in the way that he can't really get himself to feel the remorse. I mean, he feels regret, it feels like, but maybe not exactly remorse. Well, I, I, I that... didn't know any of the families. I don't know. I, right. Except for one. And maybe that's just a matter of not being able to verbalize it, which feels really something like a, a very real aspect of the character. Mm-hmm. But you really get the sense that these things really meant something to him and what ultimately ended up giving his life meaning and that he lost. And there's a, a real tragedy that you can relate to, even though the character himself, um, you know, obviously did a lot of heinous things and, you know, uh, we can't relate to that aspect of it necessarily, mm-hmm. but he gets to that core and you get the sense that despite how despicable a lot of the characters in this world are, that Martin Scorsese is able to find the redeeming quality, is able to find the human aspect that allows you to relate to them and kind of elevates the criminal world to one which can be presented very well in this kind of form of higher art, right? Mm. No, totally. Absolutely. I, I guess... Uh... I, I don't have too much more to add to uh, the the Frank thing, uh, but I, the one thing I wanted did want to say before we uh, wrap this up is like uh, just how amazing Joe Pesci was. I mean, I think a study of contrast between the you know three other Pesci movies we watched in these you know two part series, it's like in Raging Bull, Goodfellas, Casino, he's very very explosive, very very short tempered, very loud and aggressive and in your face. And this one, you know, he has all that same anger and hatred, but it's so contained and so, you know, just roiling beneath the surface. More controlled. But it's it's, it's so controlled. Yeah, exactly. That like the way he'd like some of his previous characters to carry themselves at times, right? Right. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But it was it was so striking, you know, and, and. I hadn't seen. I mean, Joe Pesci hadn't been in movies, I guess, for a while. It's kind of on a on a retirement uh, hiatus. He hadn't been in yeah, anything. Yeah, and it, I, I think a little bit too. I think that there was an appeal of this type of portrayal. Like I said, it it feels like everybody got an opportunity to bring their craft kind of full arc. And from what I understand, maybe I think Joe Pesci wasn't super interested in just reprising some of those previous roles, but I imagine yeah. that something this different and um, maybe this in line with reflecting on those previous bodies of work. Because Scorsese has um, been trying to get this made for a long time, right? I mean, this wasn't like, you know, like a year project for him. This was like more like a decade <laughs> or two project, right? right, to get right. Done. Yeah, I think 2008 is when they, they started to try to work on I mean, the book came out, what, 2004 or something like that? Yeah, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. But I think you're right. Like, I think Joe Pesci, his performance here was, it just felt next level. It felt I, like... I mean, it, it was to the point where like, I had to watch it a couple times to like appreciate the De Niro performance because Joe Pesci like stole so much of the spotlight for me. I mean, I was just right. like, you know, just like so sucked into to like you know his vortex uh, and, and like his gravity. And even Al Pacino steals the show at times too. And He's fantastic yeah. in this. I, 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 yeah, you can't take anything away from him either. <laughs> they wouldn't right. dare. Yeah. <laughs> There's another thing that I, I find super interesting about this film in, in regards to. Uh, again this being a nice final chapter to the saga is just that he finally opens up the world more where Mm -hmm. um it it, the characters start to um interact with larger historical characters there's more of a historical context um they travel outside a more localized area i mean a casino has a little bit of that because they they travel to la at one point but like the world definitely opens up in the historical context and the role that these characters um, played in uh, American history uh, is a lot more prominent. You know, mm-hmm. you have the JFK assassination, um, Bay of Pigs. the Bay of Pigs. Um, and I felt Hoffa's like that was, disappearance. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it really felt uh, again uh, like what James Elroy accomplished from you right. know, moving away from the LA quartet. That, like LA quartet to like, you know, USA under or underworld. What's it called? USA, under, underworld. USA underworld Tr- uh, trilogy. Um, and I, I thought that was great. I, and I, I don't feel like it got in the way of the authenticity or uh, very personal perspective of the film, but it did lend itself to context. And which I think is very interesting because in Casino, they do a little bit of that and talking about 
in featuring a little bit about the history of Vegas and what that point in time meant for these characters. Mm -hmm. But because this movie takes place over multiple decades, it is interesting to see the, the historical context and to see the, in a very Elroyan manner, the kind of footnote that these characters played in a lot of those bigger historical uh, moments in history. No, exactly. And and how uh, like wild was it that Frank, you know, he was delivering the guns to the uh, to the Cubans or whatever for the uh, Bay of Pigs, and the guy he was delivering it to was the same uh, you know historical figure and character that Joe Pesci played in JFK. The, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's probably right. one of his, David Ferry. Yeah, arguably one of his Eyebrows. best performances. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that that was really fascinating. I, I, I didn't even realize that. Like, I, I I knew that that was all connected, and I was like thinking back to JFK. I didn't even put that together. That's amazing. <laughs> well, there's an there's an interesting shot where they show Joe Kennedy like after a stroke, and I thought that was right. interesting because because the Kennedys were featured. It it those are the little things that I think kind of created the milieu of the movie, but gave it a bigger scope. You know, I mean, they talk about it, but but in showing some of these historical. Uh, the like where in history these characters lived, you get a sense of like how big of a role Hoffa had in that point in time in history. Um, Super powerful. You, you also get a sense of something that because his films often about um, the mob life are localized. You know, if you think about Goodfellas, right. Goodfellas is about like a neighborhood really. Yeah. Um, it just so happens that they were around an airport. That's why they, they had the airport highest um, in casino. It's in a, relatively small town but specifically it's one casino you know it's about a casino uh, but here the world is like way more opened up i mm-hmm. mean it, within the movie they travel to miami um oh, it's a it's place. a great I mean, buddy road trip movie by far it's <laughs> one for the kids <laughs> exactly um so i that's something that really stands out and something that again i felt like because scorsese has so honed his craft and has this huge obviously very impressive life and uh career experience like he's able to include that while you know not losing track of what really makes the film powerful and engaging to the Mm -hmm. audience Mm -hmm. i i I think that's a great point because like also like i mean the movie is whatever almost four hours long but it flies by while you're watching it flies by you can't um look away from it you know, there wasn't much I, I, I felt like you we wanted to, like, get rid of uh, or, like, maybe this movie is too long or whatever. Yeah, also, the guy's got a 50-year career of successful <laughs> films. Can you just give him the length that he wants of this film and be okay with it? Yeah. I mean... Well, it, that's, that's the other thing is, like, if you think about it, his films do become a little bit more challenging, but that's because they become more complex, more nuanced, more distilled. Well, look at Mean Streets. Um, it's pretty basic, right? When you think about it, it's just three guys in a bar for most of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and right. then you go into Irishman and it's just this. But it's also about like, you know, the Charlie character's guilt and his, you know, trying to uh, save his soul. I mean, it, it is very sort of similar to the, yeah. the, the way the, the Frank character ends up, um, you know, and, and wanting to like do, do penance for these things. And then, and then also like the the parallels with the Johnny Boy character and the um, the uh, the Hoffa. Uh, w- one other quick thing I wanted to bring up was that like in Raging Bull, the, the original uh, sort of cut Thelma and Marty uh, put together that like then screened for like producers and the ex- execs or whatever. It had not just old Jake LaMotta at the very beginning and at the end, but like also throughout he would like you know be telling these bits of the story, and they ended up cutting out the middle of the old Jake LaMotta out of the, out of the middle of Raging Bull and, you know, just having it be bookends. But in this one, they kind of went back to that structure and we, we kept like kind of cutting back to old Mm -hmm. Robert De Niro. It was all from his perspective with some like, you know, minor moments uh, where again, it's kind of a stylish uh, stylistic flourish where we come outside of his perspective where it's like, you know, all of a sudden uh, Russell talks to the camera. He's like, I don't want two people coming back. Right. But that like, was the difference, right? But like, you know, other than that, it was like it was it was almost entirely from Frank's perspective. And then we see all these little like obituaries of everybody when we introduce a character. I love uh, like that. Shot in the head six times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And like it's like staying within the perspective of like of of old and like and nursing home era Frank. 
even when we're when we're, we're back far uh, back in time. Like as he's telling the story, like that guy that guy was shot six times, right? As, yeah. as right, he's telling right, the story, right. but yeah, it's again him playing with visual irony, which is showing you, uh, you know, look how, you know, how suave these guys are, how slick, how important they are, or you know, how well dressed they are, and you know, this is the end they came to, right? It's juxtaposed this, um, on top of this, like good time, this, the, the fate yeah. of this guy, which is an awful right. fate usually. <laughs> well, I, and I think yeah, <laughs> more so than any of his other gangster movies, even more so than, you know, departed, which, uh, doesn't feel like you'd want to be a part of that world. But, um, in this movie, the audience is taken to a place where you really feel and are are forced to uh you know rub your nose in the consequences of this life which makes it more unappealing than uh yeah. the, the, than like the exuberance of uh you know and, and the excitement of, of things like you know in all the gangster stories there's like the ooh the rise and then the fall right but even in the rise here there's these little reminders that like you know things are pretty shitty and you know yeah. um you're walking on eggshells you're walking on eggshells and you're serving this this man, uh, master, and that master is serving another master, and that, it, it keeps going up the the chain. Even when you get to someone as powerful as Russell Buffalino, there are uh, masters he's serving. Uh, perhaps uh, you know, you know, and he keeps like, <laughs> <laughs> you know who I mean. Don't uh, say it. You don't know say they it. Can, don't say it. Look, if they you can know, whack a president, they, they can whack yeah. the president of a union. Ooh, I love that line. That was a good yeah. one. I, you know, it's interesting. You just made an interesting point. It's true. I feel like the film works on a level a very subconscious level which is the audience coming to terms with the seduction of martin scorsese's previous films like the charm and the fun and enjoyment of his previous films in the series we're finally coming to terms with the reality of what that world is and where that world ends up and where these players in that world are at the end of their lives, right? It's, I mean, it sums it up in that one dolly shot of all those old guys sitting there in the wheelchairs trying to eat and are being <laughs> fed, actually can't even fucking move in their chairs. And it's just like, right. yep, that's where everyone ends up. <laughs> that's Right, All right. And it's, it's definitely, you know, in watching it again, one of the things I really enjoyed about it is that you definitely feel like it's got the sensibility and perspective of someone that can look back and, and understand this world, understand these characters. Um, and it feels like Martin Scorsese uh, couldn't have made this movie at any other point, right? I, it just felt like he was in the perfect time in his life and career yeah. to make this film. And I feel like that is one of the greatest things about his filmmaking and his movies is that his, a lot of his films have that, right? His it's timing? Like, you feel like, <laughs> no, you feel like oh. Raging Bull was sold at a very particular coming off a very particular low point in his life, right. uh, dealing about a character, dealing with a partic- very particular low point in his life. Not an animal. You had Goodfellas kind of like riding the wave of this life and and Scorsese like, you know, embarking on a great streak of films. Like, you know, the 90s was a great streak of films for him. And it's like, then you had Casino kind of at the height of that, you know, and it's... Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and now you have this movie that... Um, like I said, it's really impacted not just by the ability to be at a point in your life when you can look back and understand what things are important to people, like when you go through a lot, what things stay with you, but also looking back at like, there's something to be said about the portrayal of Fink Shearing's relationships with Russell, with Hoffa, with his family as being heavily impacted by, you know, De Niro's relationship with the other actors, right, with Pesci and um, even Al Pacino and definitely all their relationships with Martin Scorsese. Like um, in that sense, like uh, it's worth whatever shortcomings might be in the de-aging, Brian, because Mm -hmm. I had the same problem. I think at times uh, it doesn't work as well. I think sometimes the physicality of the characters didn't quite match the ages they were supposed the, to be. The grocery right. store fight was one of those examples. Yeah, that, that, that was the big one. But Scorsese said it himself. If you didn't make it that way, if you didn't spend two years developing the technology, which is pretty amazing um, for what they were able to do, you know, there would have been you know half of the film that he wouldn't have been able to do with Robert De Niro. And although right. objectively you might say, perhaps that's how I would have done it, um, there's this like kind of next level or subconscious uh, you know, personal uh, 
touch or flourish to the movie that comes from, you know, having spent, a, I mean, I think he's known Robert De Niro since they were in their teens in the neighborhood. I mean, like, you know, right. that, that kind of shorthand and being on the same wavelength, like you can't replicate that with just anybody. Uh, I think we should wrap up. That was really well said on that one. Yeah. Uh, do, do we have one more point or something? Or no, do we want to just good place to end it for me? Yeah, that was great. Andy, yet again, thank you so much for joining us and adding your insight into this. I'm, I'm sure you're not a huge Scorsese fan at all, so this is probably <laughs> real trying to get through yeah. these movies. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry to, to, sorry sorry to make you watch these. <laughs> no, I, I, re- I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I, Same. This yeah. is a lot of fun. It's obviously great to join you guys. I feel like the conversation is always very insightful, so thanks again for having me. Yeah, hopefully one of these days, maybe when all this uh, pandemic stuff ends, we can actually go see a movie and uh you know like enjoy this together but until then we'll just uh enjoy this podcast yeah i think i think what we do is we do one episode where we all go to a theater or we you know maybe we just do like a a screening together and then we could do like record one where it's just like us at the coffee shop talking about the movie afterwards (laughs) or talk no correction us at the coffee shop talking about the uh the triple feature we just watched. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> with, with a slice of pie, just like true romance. <laughs> if only we could make it out to the Goodfellas Diner, right? Which I think was all, wasn't that, I think that was all, wasn't that also in, was it in Casino? Or it, no, it, it was in this one, in, in Irishman, Irishman right? where it was like, uh, w- where he meets the other whispers uh, to discuss right. the, uh, the other plant. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I love that scene in, in Goodfellas when he's like, that's the first time Jimmy ever asked right, me to whack right, somebody. Right. I knew at that point I was a dead man. <laughs> <laughs> Look, oh, wait, you guys want to talk about Goodfellas real quick? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Next week, we will be talking about yet again another banger. Inspiring <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. We finally got some Indiana Jones on this show. I'm really excited about that. We've got a... Doing it. A three-movie deal here. Uh, Secret of the Incas from 1954, Papillon from 1973, and then, of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark from 1981. Very excited to get Raiders of the Lost Ark in here, Jeremy. And I've never seen the other two, so this is great to see those inspirations. And I love the inspiring series. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we're we're back to our uh, good buddy George Lucas, who uh, (laughs) likes to uh, take things from other other movies. Uh, You know, I, I think... If anyone's familiar with Papillon, uh, it, it might feel like a stretch uh, just saying it at, the, at this point. But when you when you watch them back to back, you'll you'll see it. It's uh, it's not subtle. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. We'll uh, you know not only because yeah we're getting Indiana Jones, but uh, we're kind of going to see where he came from. Yeah, I love that. All right. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, please make sure to subscribe and follow us on all the podcasts and social platforms at the Grindhouse Institute. And if you really want to give us a boost, check us out on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps us to get noticed. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be back next week. Ciao. Listen, Frank. Things have gotten out of hand with our friend again. You're going to have to talk to him and tell him it's what it is. He's at a higher-ups. Well, he's a higher-up, too. I mean, no one. If they can whack a president, they can whack a president of a union.